Hello, everyone. Welcome to Small Biz Tips. So a few months ago, my partner said, you need to watch these guys' podcast. They are killing it. And I'm like, what is this? So I watched the podcast and I was so amazed and blown away by these guys that I had to bring one of them in today. Elliot, what's up, man? What's going on? I'm glad to be here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for jumping on. I really appreciate this. So um, before we dive into all your expertise, Right. Let's talk about who is Elliot. Yeah, uh, I'm just a kid from Ann Arbor, Michigan, man. I had the same barber as the Fab Five growing up. Okay. Uh, I went on to engineering school, uh, did some consulting, um, won the business school lottery and went to Harvard Business School. I was still a conservative dude then. (laughs) Um, But I was I was behind about 300 people in the private equity line, even at Harvard Business School. So I just Mm. called 250 people and I got one yes. And that's all I needed. So I started Uh. working in private equity and um, I was in a city that just did not sit right with me for Mm. for 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 black people who have spent any time in Boston. You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) I went Uh, to 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 Boston. (laughs) So I know, you know what exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so I, I was like, hey, before I was in, in Boston, I was in Atlanta enjoying life. I went back to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And that's what started sparking my entrepreneurial endeavors, because to stay in the deal world in a much smaller market um, with very few private equity solutions and no party who's going to hire me, I had to create my own. Mm-hmm. So I spent the past 10, 12 years building um deal businesses and now a deal advisory business out of atlanta and now i help first-time buyers self-funded buyers everyday buyers um the way i say it is like uh close good deals and kick bad ones out so that's the advice that i provide to people i I like that close good deals kick bad ones out right so over the past couple years acquisition as becoming sexy Right. Everybody yes. want to go and buy businesses. Now you see people that were in real estate, they're moving to a business acquisition, but a lot of people are not talking about how do you buy good deals and keep the bad ones out. So tell us more about right. that. You know, have you, you've been helping people. How does that work? Right? Like I sold my last company, so I had a great experience. Um, but a lot of people don't. Right. So when it comes to buying businesses, how do you sure. identify what a good one? <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so what I've learned over time is that the only way to really know is muscle memory, mm. which is why my advisory services are so important. I can't I can't give you like 15 years of deal experience and muscle memory on what a good deal is and a bad deal is. I also there's no like Porter's Five Forces or like some mm. list in Warren Buffett's office with the 15 <laughs> industries that you should buy in and the, the 15 that you should never buy in. It's very nuanced. And so what is a good business? One with sustainable profit, mm-hmm. a defensible market position. We call it a moat. That's not a fancy thing. Just um, if, if 10 people could enter your market and you could still kick their behind, you have a moat. If 10 okay. people can enter your market and take all your business, you don't. <laughs> and anybody in business will understand that. And then uh, one that you can grow and scale efficiently. And so, mm. you know, whether that's a trucking company, a digital marketing agency, a home service business, which are all the fad, those are good deals. But a good deal also comes to price and structure. So you can actually ruin a great deal by overpaying uh-huh. or not structuring it correctly. And so all those things are wrapped up in the advisory services we provide because I could spend four hours describing the minute details on yeah. what is good and bad. And in fact, the guy who Brian Shields, who was on the podcast you saw with me initially, we've riffed for two or three hours about this and still have more time. So you really have to, I think you have to hop into the water a little bit mm-hmm. and then try to get the best advice you can get. Cause you know, you only have like 12 to 18 months most time to get it right. Interesting. You said that, but, expound on that. What do you mean by you have 12 to 18 months to get it right? So the two main ways everyday buyers acquire companies is either on a part-time search or a full-time search, right? Mm -hmm. So um, full-time search is simpler to explain. I'm tired of this nine to five job. 
I am tired of dealing with this boss. I've saved up enough money. I've convinced my partner. I'm going to go spend 12 months on a full-time basis looking for a business to buy. And good golly gosh, in 12 months, I'm going to have one that I'm going to acquire. Gotcha. That's my goal for 2024. Boom. Well, month 13, if you don't get that done, your partner's like, hey, you going back to work? Your bank account's <laughs> like, hey, you were punishing me? <laughs> and so most people who decide on a full-time search that don't get it done in 12 to 18 months have to go back to a nine to five, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have that collapsing window. And then let's go to the part-time search. So most of my folks are married, 30s, 40s, 50s, right? So now you got a wife or a husband, you have mm -hmm. a couple of kids. So now you're saying, hey, after I do my 60 hours on the job and take care of my kids and be a good partner to my, my partner, now I'm going to spend those 10 to 15 hours weekly making calls, talking to brokers off their daytime calls because you don't have time during the day to do it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to burn the candle at work, at home, and on the deal um, landscape to go try to create this million-dollar opportunity that nobody sees but me. And I promise you in about 12 to 18 months, your partner, <laughs> your friends, your, bank your body – is all going to tell you, hey, man, it's about time to hang it up. And so in either capacity, you have kind of that same 12 to 18 months realistically to give it a shot, or you're probably going to have to figure something else out. Wow. Uh, it, I'm glad you shared the reality behind the deal acquisition, because a lot of people think, you know, it comes out, you, you, see, a, you see a business, you just buy it. Like, Tell us about right. that <laughs> because you, you've seen all the stories, right? What has been in, you know, examples you can share, you know, so some of those war stories that you've seen when people try to buy businesses, it looks good on paper. It's making sure. 2 million a year. It's doing over 500 key EBITDA. Like what, what are some of those war <laughs> things that you've seen? Those how, rooms, how long do you have, Jules? <laughs> this is the one. <laughs> Let's do one. Fair enough. Uh, a recent one this year, one of my favorite clients um, brought me, so he had a deal on a letter of intent and he wanted me to do what's called a quality of earnings on the business, which is essentially a mini audit to make sure the numbers are solid and the seller's not lying. Um, and that's one of the principal things that I sell. Um, call it $10 million in revenue, just under $3 million of seller's discretionary earnings. So EBITDA plus what the mm -hmm. seller took out of the business. Allegedly. Um, client was a black male. Mm -hmm. Company was in the Southeast. Okay. Uh, pretty far outside of a major city. I, I, I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so the seller, the seller CPA, and the broker all saw me as the quality of earnings provider and thought they saw a sucker and were going to lick it. Um, and, and, and put my black client into a very bad situation. Mm. We start looking through the financials and the folks had double counted a million dollars of depreciation and tried to tell me that their accounting um, analysis that was different than generally accepted accounting principles or gap that all of us learn in business yep. school or in accounting school, that their math was better. Huh? And then... <laughs> Um, once I was able to retort that and get that bogus EBITDA kicked out, so now we're down to $2 million of EBITDA. Um, I also was able to remind my clients that in a, it was a, it was a asset heavy business. So you have mm -hmm. to subtract CapEx because you're going to have to put capital expenditures to the business each year. Let's call CapEx another $800,000. Wow. So we went from 3 million to 2 million to 1.2. Wow. Then... Um, sure. So we went from $3 million uh -huh. down to $2 million because of the double counted depreciation, then down another $800,000 because of the capital expenditure. Wow. And then all of a sudden, the seller and broker have a miraculous $500,000 of prepaids that they never told anybody about for the past nine months that just showed up that day that weren't really prepaids. And so they were trying to pass off a business that was doing about $1.2 million of true EBITDA wow. as doing $3 million of EBITDA. And not only were they pushing the numbers, but they were trying to push 
an accounting construct that wasn't GAAP, thinking that myself or my client would be silly, stupid, impatient enough to do that deal. And it would have bankrupted my client oh in my six God. months. Wow. You just saved them a lot of money, my friend. So did they end up doing the deals or that deal didn't go through? Oh, thank God. No. I mean, I, um, I, what happens a lot of times is buyers fall in love with the deal, particularly when it's yeah. their first time. So I did have to spend some time like talking this client off the ledge, but I was emphatically talking them off the ledge. I was ready to fight if they were ready to keep going. And and now I'm working on another deal that's way better. So the client's coming back for a second deal that's fixing a lot of the wrongs from the first one. So I think I probably spent three or four hours talking that client off the ledge. It's coming back to me um, yeah. as a, a long-term client. So um, I'm curious, right? When is a good time somebody needs to come to you? Is it before they put out the LOI or after they do out the LOI when they're about to go, the LOI got accepted and they're going to do diligence? It is a little bit of both. So about yeah. a month before you think you're going to get a signed LOI, it's in your best interest to be in my ecosystem. Okay. So you can sort of get to know me versus others, all this kind of stuff. You can also... Um, benefit from i do free loi reviews mm. i do um a lot of um pre-loi advisory stuff so you can sort of be in a better position now the other great time is like the day you get the loi signed or within a day or yeah. two reach out to me because what i would say is um if you want to start your quality of earnings and have enough time to get your deal closed you need to really start within a week of getting a signed loi okay in your experience, when it comes to due diligence, I know it varies, right? What have you seen has been, because, you know, like my, when I sold my business, it was like a, a six month process. Well, mm -hmm. others, it could be three months. Others, it could be more, right? What have you seen sure. has been that balance? And, you know, what would you recommend for any business owners when they're going through that process to help them? couple of things it's it's probably six months is probably on the short end of the time to sell a business so i think you were fortunate in that i would say more than likely people are spending 12 months as a seller to 18 months mm -hmm. selling a business even in today's kind of hyper intense um, market where there's a lot of buyers it's just difficult because it's going to take two or three months for a broker to put together a confidential information memorandum on your business it's going to mm -hmm. take four to six months to go out to market and see who wants to, to buy it. And it's going to take yeah. another three to six months for them to close the deal. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing closer to 12 to 18 months. I, I would also say I'm seeing a lot of sellers choose to do what's called a sell side quality of earnings. What's so what the sellers that? will do. Yeah. So um, typically the buyers have done quality of earnings. It's a mini audit. So you can make sure the sellers not lying. Yeah. But for a seller who's still got to run the company, um, needs to be the hero of their sales story, Yeah. Um, doesn't want to get beat up over accounting anomalies and probably doesn't want a foreign accountant mm -hmm. doing what I call like a proctological exam on their business. They'd rather pay to have that done themselves and have their doctor do it, essentially. Yeah. And then that way you go to market with, here's my confidential information memorandum. Here's my third party quality of earnings. You can verify all the numbers are solid, but I don't have to spend as a seller, you know, 10 hours on phone calls and four all to six stuff. weeks yeah. waiting. Gotcha. Here's the numbers. They're already checked. Make your best offer. I'm not going to bull junk with you about minor adjustments. Um, yeah. Because on the other side, when buyers get in and we do our quality of earnings, admittedly, a buyer's best interest is to knock the price down as much as possible. So oftentimes, buyers exaggerate small issues and make them bigger than they need to be. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> that is, that's is like, that, these are the truth that a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to business acquisition. And I'm curious, um, f you know, you've seen a lot of deals before. You've seen how the deals are structured since you mentioned it earlier today. What has sure. been in your experience, um, you know, like lessons that you've gotten from being in this journey, you know, because you've been doing this for 10 plus years. What's like the top right. three lessons you've you've learned that you think other buyers can benefit from? <laughs> Don't trust anybody is the first lesson. Ooh. And I um, this is as an entrepreneur speaking, this is a man of faith speaking. Um, 
as a head of household speaking. So I'm not going like that crazy level. What I'm saying is when it's your money, when it's a million dollar personal guarantee, mm -hmm. when there's parties that you don't understand have incentives that are absolutely opposite yours. Like those brokers, sellers, and bankers mm -hmm. were going to sell my client a $10 million business that really should have been a $3 million business and bankrupt him. When you have people in the industry that will do that, yeah, you can't trust anyone. You have to verify everything. So the first thing would be kind of don't trust people, verify everything. Second would be a lot of people miss that although the SBA will um, want at least a 10% seller note in a lot of these mm -hmm. deals, that is far too low of a seller participation in a deal to keep a seller connected to the transaction. And, and, and let me wow. give you quick math. Let's say you're buying a business for 10 million bucks, make the math easy. Yeah. And you're saying, hey, seller, I want you to keep a $1 million note. And you're thinking, oh, yeah, he won't walk away from a million bucks. And I got this guy connected. He's going to help me learn the business. And if something really messy happens, I'm going to be able to call him because I owe him a million bucks. <laughs> He's already in the Cayman Islands spending that nine million bucks, and <laughs> and anything that gets hard, he's not picking up the phone for. It. The only stuff that you'll get him for is stuff that's easy most times. So you need a larger than ten percent holdback to keep sellers um, connected to the business during a transition period. And third would be in small deals. I would say under ten million dollars, certainly under five or three million dollars. The financial answer. The EBITDA, the working capital, yeah. is probably only 50% of the information you need to determine if the deal is good or bad. Why? Yeah. Single people in small businesses, single industries, single competitors, a single salesperson, a single process could make a $10 million business be the most sustainable thing you've ever seen or the most rickety likely to fall off a cliff thing you've ever seen. And if you can't, and haven't had experience connecting like the operations of a business to the sustainability of the cash flow, you got to be really careful just saying, oh, well, the EBIT has a million bucks, I'm going to pay four times. You don't get any of the historical mm. EBITDA, Jules. You're only buying the go-forward EBITDA. So you have to have some concept, some projection. So those are the three things that I would say. Wow. Like, don't trust people more than 10% seller holdbacks and be as thoughtful about the go-forward cash flow as you are at looking at the historical. Wow. Wow. We got to have you come back, man, for a second round. This is amazing. How do people get in touch with you if they want to work with you? What does that look like? Where do they go? Sure. Yeah. My website is Guardian Due Diligence. Uh, it's long, but if you get even close to it on Google, my SEO will put you in the right place. Okay. Uh, on Twitter, which is my number one social, Elliot E. Holland, um, King of QOE on Twitter. Um, I'm most active there. You can also find me on YouTube, Guardian Due Diligence. I have over 150 videos there. So any of those places you can find me and then my contact information, email and phone number are on my website. So I'm not hard to catch. Fantastic. Oh yeah, thank you so much, brother, for jumping on. This was amazing sharing those gems with everybody. Guys, I'm telling you, he's one of the best that I know in the space. So thank you so much for jumping on, brother. Thanks for having me, Joe.